IPSC industrial pharmacy section of FIP. I'm one of the moderators and my colleague Maria Manziri will be my co-moderator. Uh, welcome uh, to today's webinar. The topic is QBD in biologics, drug product development and manufacturing. Uh, and the panelist is Dr. Sampath Krishnan is executive director in macrogenics based out of Rockville, uh, outside of Washington, D.C. Um, so Krishnan, can we go to the next slide? Yeah, this is just a brief summary of what FIP and industrial pharmacy section does. Uh, we, we service uh, pharmacists and industrial pharmacy specialists around the world. I can see that there are attendees from all the way from Australia and New Zealand today. So we are truly international. Let's go to the next slide. Yeah, you, you know, you can join us, you know, if you click on the URL that you see on this particular slide, you, you will be taken to the uh, website where if you're interested, you can join us. Let's go to the next slide. So you can uh, reach us on multiple social media. Here is a number of them and uh, it's, it's your choice which one you want to use. Let's go to the next slide, Krishnan. <clears throat> okay, there it is. So Krishnan, it's, it's your presentation. Please proceed. All right. Let me actually move to the next slide. So thank you, Matthew and Maria. Uh, thank, thank you to all the organizers at FIP. Um, and uh, good morning to, uh, to audiences here in the US and uh, good afternoon and uh, evening um, for audiences uh, throughout the the globe. Um, so as Matthew indicated, um, the title of my talk is, um, is primarily integrating uh, QBD-based approaches in biologics, drug product development, and manufacturing. First, I want to present the outline of my talk. Um, I'll be talking about uh, the diversity of biologics products um, and the need for product and uh, process understanding. Then I'll get into the quality by design approach and integrating these approaches in uh, development and manufacturing in general, but giving examples for biologic struct product as we delve into it. Um, what I want to share is uh, are the key concepts and approaches, uh, which includes uh, the target product profiles, the CQA assessment, uh, process risk assessment, process categorization, control strategies, um, how, to, how does these uh, key concepts apply uh, for biologic drug product development and manufacturing. And um, towards the end, I would, um, I would give an example of a primary container development and categorization um, because that's, uh, uh, that's as another layer uh, when we think about uh, going from simple vial presentations to complex uh, combination product uh, presentations. So I'll give some examples related to that. And I'll close out with a summary. So uh, just to start with, um, I work at uh, uh, Macrogenics and uh, as uh, primarily Macrogenics is as a deep and differentiated immuno-oncology pipeline. Uh, what we develop is uh, our number of biologic molecules, including antibody um, molecules, bispecifics, and antibody drug conjugates are called ADCs. Um, so we have um, a number of uh, programs in the pipelines. Uh, uh, the ones which are in uh, early to late stage uh, pipeline are uh, molecules are shown over here. Um, these molecules are developed uh, uh, with uh, other partners throughout the globe. Um, we have an approved product and we also have a bispecific and uh, antibody in late stage development going, having gone through PPQ. Um, so, 
what uh, the set of molecules and a body by specific and ADCs that we, um, that we are working on within macrogenics is part of the universe of biologics. Um, and the universe is constantly expanding like our own universe. Um, what I define as a biologic is uh, uh, so that everyone is on the same page is a product that is produced in living organisms are contain components of living organisms. Um, so uh, in the 70s to the 2000s, uh, biologics was primarily blood products, including um, uh, the clotting factors, um, um, uh, the factor eight and factor nine, factor 10, all these blood-based products. Then we went into peptides. In, uh, then there was peptides, insulin, which has been there for, uh, uh, for a long period of time. And then towards 80s to the 2000s, we saw a number of products which came out, including cytokines, hormones, and then slowly antibodies. And then when uh, the protein engineering or biologic engineering concepts developed, we started seeing complex molecules, including fusion proteins, and then bispecifics. The bispecifics uh, use the variable domain of multiple uh, different antibodies uh, for different targets and bring it together through a linker. Um, and then we have antibody drug conjugates. Um, as I explained, uh, we are working within macrogenics on few of the antibody drug conjugates. What it is, is you have a toxic payload um, uh, with respect to tox uh, toxic to the cancerous cells, which are linked to your antibody, which acts like a, a which targets it towards the tumor. Um, and uh, in the last 20 years, or lot, I would say in the last 10 years more so, um, uh, a number of you, I mean, uh, the audience is quite familiar with gene therapy technologies and mRNA technologies, which actually have given us uh, some of the wonderful uh, biologics product recently, including uh, COVID vaccines, um, and also CAR-T technologies. Um, I believe there was a webinar prior to mine on CAR-T, which is a chimeric antigen receptor uh, technologies. And along with this, uh, mRNA and gene therapy technologies has been used to fight cancer. Um, so it is just, uh, it's, uh, it's, we are in a very exciting phase on biologics development. There is a rapid uh, development of these products on a almost like a not, not even a decade basis. It's almost like on a yearly basis, right? So uh, the, this universe of biologics is constantly expanding. So uh, what is uh, some of the aspects of biologics uh, development? So development and manufacturing of uh, these biologic molecules, as I mentioned, is evolving rapidly. On the panel towards the left, I show you, I mean, in terms of uh, a, 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 an aspirin molecule, which is a small molecule. And over the years, as I mentioned, we have gone into insulin, into cytokines, antibodies uh, development, and uh, the differences between uh, compared to a small molecule is size and complexity. Uh, some of these antibodies are 150,000 Daltons compared to a 180 Dalton uh, aspirin molecule. Um, so a number of amino acids are make up of the antibodies. Uh, so the complexity is more, but also the stability and administration aspects are uh, complex as well. And as I mentioned, what, is, uh, what has evolved as well is over the years, as uh, from the time proteins uh, were discovered, um, we have uh, insulins in the 70s, the cytokines, and then antibodies. And now, every year, we come up with a new technology product in the biologic space. Um, so this is uh, the process, and uh, our understanding of uh, uh, complex molecules uh, has rapidly evolved, and it's exponentially growing. So. Uh, for these biologics, um, I'm giving you an example of protein therapeutics. Okay, so we have protein therapeutics which are normally uh, which are normally made in E. coli, yeast, insect, or mammalian cells. These uh, need to be uh, the, some of these uh, systems are shown in the in the photographs. Uh, these uh, the protein is isolated and refolded, then it's purified, and this this is what we call as drug substance. And then we take the drug substance and then take it to formulation full finish. It needs to be stored and transported and then uh, administered to patients at clinical sites through delivery devices. So this aspect is called drug product. 
Now, in the biologics, in, for an antibody molecule, there are distinct drug substance and drug product. But as we get to novel technologies, the, there is continuous merging of this. Uh, for example, CAR T technologies, we have some of these uh, drug substance and drug product merge into each other. Um, so, what I'm going to be uh, uh, talking about is primarily the drug product, but also the concepts apply to a drug substance as well. Um, mainly, I want to showcase using case studies uh, with, the, with the drug product. Now, with the biologic drug product, delving into a little bit more, apart from the complexities of the molecules itself, uh, we have the complexities of the process. Um, so for the drug product, we have a number of factors determining the robustness of biologics formulation and drug product unit operations, right? Um, as I said, uh, the molecule can be complex. The, the drug substance which comes from, uh, which we make has residuals from the host cell uh, that makes it. Uh, so those need to be removed. We need to have an understanding of the drug substance. Then the formulation, full finish operations. We, there are several factors that need to be understood. How to do an UFDF from the drug substance to the, uh, to the drug product formulation. How to the Fullerton devices. How to analyze using analytical methods. And, and also uh, for release. And also how to store it and administer to patients. Um, so you, you catch the concept. As, as complex as the biologics uh, is, we have a lot of understanding over the years. And also the process, we have developed a tremendous amount of understanding of what are the processes and how it affects uh, critical quality attributes. Um, how do we manage this entire knowledge? And that's where QBD uh, comes in. So the quality by design approaches is mainly a set of tools, I would say, uh, to be integrated uh, into the entire development and manufacturing to ensure one, patient safety, that's foremost, and number two, commercialization success for the companies developing uh, these products. Now, getting into the quality by design, I, I think uh, uh, primarily uh, quality by design principle is defined in ICHQ8. Um, and that's a wonderful document for everyone to go in and review if you want to have more knowledge of QBD. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to actually just spell out the key words, right? Um, the, so quality by design is a systematic approach to development. It has predefined objectives or target that we work towards. It emphasizes product and process understanding, either through platform knowledge or uh, each organization develops their own product and process understanding. It has to be science-based and it is quality risk management uh, should be incorporated. So these are the key concepts. Um, and it's uh, uh, shown uh, uh, in this wonderful QBD circle developed uh, uh, and has been published widely where we start with the desired product performance in mind and design the product process and then ensure process performance. This is, uh, this is ensheathed in the concepts of product and process understanding and continuous improvement. So it's an uh, iterative process where we go through defining the target, developing it, uh, ensuring performance and looking at redeveloping it if, requ if required. Um, so the fundamental, uh, uh, so QB, quality by design or QBD is a grassroots approach uh, of building quality into a product. It requires understanding of the product and its manufacturing process. Now, what I'm going to talk to you today about is not about quality by design filing, um, because there are companies who have been successful in defining the design space and thoroughly characterizing it and, and the filing that design space with regulatory uh, authorities. Um, such efforts uh, are, have been done by a uh, few companies, but for majority of other biologics companies, including uh, us in macrogenics, we have used incorporated quality by design approaches uh, into the development and manufacturing. And uh, it uh, necessarily doesn't involve the full design space development, but involves the key concepts uh, that we want to use in the development and manufacturing aspects. So uh, this, this particular flowchart gives you a clear, pretty clear view. Um, this is uh, quality by design for biopharmaceuticals published almost a decade ago. 
Um, it, and it reiterates the concepts that we talked about. Um, so we have, uh, um, uh, we have predefined objectives, uh, which is identified through a target product profile. We identify the CQAs, and then we define the product and the process space. And how do we do it is through a number of risk assessments. Um, and these risk assessments and characterization leads to the final process, which is then for which we develop the control strategy and take it through process validation and process monitoring, right? Now, these risk assessments are important because uh, these, are essential, these are essential concepts of QBD because uh, the whole knowledge base and the platform knowledge is immense. And what these risk assessments do help is to crystallize, hey, what knowledge you do applies to your product? What do we, what do we really need to be take, uh, keeping in mind for developing and evolving the product? So this, uh, the concepts of risk assessment and characterization and control strategy are the approaches, the QBD approaches, which uh, has become mainstream uh, QBD uh, concepts, which everyone is now following. Now, uh, uh, as I mentioned, the CQA identified through risk assessment, uh, the product space defi uh, defined through risk assessment, and then the, it's, uh, it's further analyzed or characterized uh, through process characterization studies. Then you define what are the process parameters uh, which are critical or key, and then it uh, goes into control strategy establishment, also uh, uh, achieved through risk assessments before going into your PPQ. Now I'm going to walk you through some of these concepts using some examples. That is actually an, um, an extensive uh, uh, white paper which has been published by the industry and FDA and it's called the AMAP case study. So everyone can access, have access to it. You, if you want to use, if you want to uh, apply QBD concept for your biologic, this is easy to search for on your, uh, go to Google, search for an AMAP case study, you will have a PDF document which is published by the CAS Association. I'm not going to go into the details, but uh, talking about the key concepts. Um, so this document talks about product understanding and process understanding. So for product understanding, it actually, uh, we have to define what are the critical quality attributes uh, which affect the safety, efficacy, uh, toxicity and immunogenicity of molecules. And then once you have identified the CQAs, then you have process targets and develop the process development and categorization and design space and develop the control strategies. What is critical is use this risk-based approach. So for CQA assessment, we evaluate the severity of that, C of that quality attribute by its potential impact on safety, efficacy, toxicity, and immunogenicity and uncertainty. And this is where we leverage the platform knowledge, the literature knowledge or inter, uh, knowledge which uh, is accumulated through the organization uh, to define what are the CQAs. And then the same applies, this risk assessment concept also applies for process. So for process based on severity, which comes from the CQA assessment, whether a particular process parameter um, affects the CQA, how much does it affect is reflected in the occurrence. And then you, we put in detectability, whether we have the appropriate control measures or analytical methods to, uh, to control that, uh, uh, that impact. So these are the concepts uh, which, are, uh, uh, which are defined uh, in this document, which you can go through. And uh, depending on the attribute and the different types of strategies, uh, can be used to control your CQAs. Uh, it's not one fit, one fit all uh, uh, approach. There are different approaches which could be used for controlling the CQAs and the effect of uh, process parameters on these CQAs, okay? Now it comes to the, the big uh, thing. So we have drug product manufacturing, we have QBD. Now, how does it come together? So, during the, the this, that is uh, the, the guidance for industry process validation, which the FDA has published. And this talks about stage one, stage two, and stage three. Stage one being, hey, initial development and characterization of a process, going into commercial process qualification, and then continued process verification. These three stages together form process validation, right? 
And where uh, QBD needs to be uh, incorporated, the key concepts uh, need to be incorporated is using this for, during the process development and categorization phase. And also using the, these concepts, which we are going to talk about to develop the control strategy for process performance qualification. So this is an iterative process where process validation involves a series of activities throughout the life cycle and the QBD concepts needs to be integrated and continuously revisited throughout the life cycle. All right, so first tool, target product profile and quality target product profile. So a target product profile um, is, is a first step for us to get a predefined objectives, right? It's our target. So this is brought together by research, development, clinical, commercial marketing uh, groups getting together and hey, defining, hey, what is this? What are we trying to develop? Have a target for it. What is the minimum acceptable uh, target result? And then the ideal result. What is the indication? How are we going to administer? Uh, what are the dosage forms? What, what, what is the efficacy that we expect? And what are the side effects that we want to keep a threshold for? Um, is it going to be an antibody or is it going to be a bispecific or is it going to be a CAR T? All this defi is defined upfront, right? And you have the minimal acceptable result and then ideal results. So this gives the basis uh, for how to develop, uh, uh, it's the first step for QBD. And there's a good resource document, the FDA CEDAR uh, 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 a document on target product profile and how to develop it walks through how to come up with this target product profile. And we're not going to get through this. So this is a high level target, right? This is, this is an overall profile. Next step goes into what is called the quality target product profile. So you take the target product profile and, and actually build, it, build out this quality TPP. So as I show, showed, the previous one was for an oncology indication. It's an antibody. Now, the quality target product profile deep dives into the chemistry, manufacturing, and controls aspect. What is the type of antibody we want to use? What is the dose? What is the protein content? Um, wh what should be the ideal drug product concentration? And what is the container presentation? So these are one half of the quality target product profile. Then you have the, we have to define what is the target shelf life. So for CAR T and uh, some of these COVID vaccines, you know that um, the shelf life uh, because of the market, because it's a fast moving product and also the nature of the product, the shelf life can be limited and it, that could be commercially viable. But for some of the antibodies and antibody based molecules, it's, uh, it, it's typical to see greater than uh, three years of shelf life. So that needs to be defined upfront. And after that, you have to define what are the physical properties and also the stability profile that you want to target, how much clips, aggregates and uh, glycosylation, those, those kind of like uh, concepts you need to define upfront. And how do you define this? It's based on platform knowledge and what is already out there and also uh, a company's own experience with that particular class of model. So the different aspects of drug product target for biologics. So out of the QTPP, the, uh, the, the, the biologics drug product person then starts thinking about, hey, what should be my stability in the drug product? Um, what should be the manufacturability aspects that I need to take into consideration? How robust the product has to be through the drug substance and the drug product stresses? Uh, what should I take into consideration for delivery? And also how do I lower cost or COGS to make this commercially viable? So as you see, I mean, I think the first exercise is pretty much defining uh, how your CMC profile should look like and uh, getting a good QTPP or quality target product profile is very important, All right? And once the drug product person has this uh, list, then we can go on to the next stage. And the next stage is primarily quality, critical quality attributes. Um, so the CQA knowledge is used for a quality by de design approach 
is is a stepping stone for QBD, right? I mean, uh, apart from the TPP, the next step is uh, CQA assessment because the the CQA knowledge is the foundation for product and process risk assessment. Once once you understand what are the critical quality attributes, then we can define how the process affects the CQAs and evaluate that through the process characterization studies. Then we can define what are the key pro process parameter ranges based on the process characterization studies. And then we can go to the final step, which is uh, phase appropriate risk tolerance, control strategy definition and process monitoring. So the CQA is the first step before we get into the subsequent steps. Now, a critical quality attribute has several aspects to it, right? So we have, um, it needs to take into account for biologic, primary structure, higher order structure, functional assays, but also for biologics, it's very important or critical to think about what can come from your host, cell, host cells that are making these biologics, the host cell proteins or host cell residuals, then finished drug product attributes, such as, for example, if you want to have your product as a lyo, residual moisture becomes important. That is a, it's an example of a finished drug product attribute. And also, as we are making, uh, uh, going from one process to the other, how does the product uh, profile compare for this pro one process versus the second process? Is it compatible? So these are the different aspects of CQAs that need to be taken into consideration. Now, giving a little bit more example, um, there are different tool sets available for different biologic products, okay? What I'm showing through these slides is a list of panels which you can use for an antibody or a protein-based therapeutics. So as I mentioned, one, uh, one panel which uh, lands uh, most commonly as the release and the stability methods is, is for your purity. You need to ensure the purity of your antibodies, that is size exclusion, ion exchange, CE uh, and uh, reverse phase methods. Then we have what are uh, other panels which uh, can fit in a characterization, more as a characterization assays, or can land as a release and a stability assay. Primary structure of the uh, biologics. The higher order structure, how does these molecules look uh, at a, once they, the primary and secondary structures are formed? And then the glycan profile, uh, when these molecules are made in the cells, they undergo post-translational modifications uh, due to glycan addition. How does a glycan profile look like for these molecules? So there are, uh, just like the product and the process knowledge, the analytical tool sets have evolved tremendously over the last couple of decades. We are having new tools coming out um, every, uh, every, uh, other, every year. So, we need to do a constant assessment of what is appropriate for uh, assessing the product and defining your CQAs. So uh, I don't want to go through line by line for each of these. Uh, these will be available through the slide deck. Um, but apart from the panels that I showed previously, you can also assess functional activity. Uh, you have ELISA-based assays, you have cell proliferation assays, and you can also have FC effector function assays. These are these are technologies which has evolved in the last couple of uh, decades uh, to look at the functional activity of the molecule. It is also important that we need to keep an eye on residuals, process residuals, which are coming from the host cells, which are making these biologics product, uh, including host cell protein and DNA, column leachates, which are used for, columns which are used for manufacturing can have leachates, and a number of other physical properties. So this is not supposed to be an exhaustive list, but gives you an example of type of uh, attributes or type of technologies or methods you need to keep in mind. An example is an antibody, right? So using these tool sets, uh, including the mass spectrometry based techniques, there has been a tremendous amount of knowledge which has developed over the last uh, couple of decades. Uh, we know that antibodies, what are the amino acids, uh, they can go through uh, um, uh, deamidation. They can go through a cross-linking. Um, they can go to uh, oxidation, flip formation, and aggregates. So there has been, a, uh, for different classes of molecules, there has been development of all these knowledge over 
and uh, uh, over the last couple of years, and we have developed this knowledge, and each company also has this knowledge, uh, which has evolved. Um, and mass spectrometry and these high power tools have helped us get there. So using uh, this, these, these tools, analytical tools, and also how do we do a CQA assessment, right? The CQA assessment is primarily using uh, the, what are these, uh, what are the, uh, what are the uh, uh, attributes which has an effect on biological activity, PKPD, immunogenicity and safety, whether it's low, moderate or high. Um, and then do we, how, do, how much we know about this uh, quality attribute? Uh, do we have platform knowledge or have we developed that internally? So using a product of impact and uncertainty, we come up with this risk score, which is used to define whether it's a non-CQA or a CQA. Um, primarily only based on severity of uh, these molecules on PKPD safety, efficacy, and immunogenicity. And you have a list of expected potential and final CQAs. So this is a list, this is important uh, to develop. Now what happens is throughout the product life cycle, as we go from early stage to mid stage, uh, phase three and PPQ stage, this, this uh, product knowledge evolves, right? So initially, you may have a platform CQAs, which are through literature and platform knowledge. But as we gain more understanding uh, through stability studies, you, we then develop specific products, uh, potential CQAs. And then uh, as we uh, go through more advanced uh, development, uh, based on the stage of the molecule, you develop a final CQA list where you isolate these quality attributes and look at their effect on safety, efficacy, and immunogenicity. And then you develop the final CQAs before we develop the process, before we go into a PPQ stage. Now, the important thing uh, for QBD is all these CQA knowledge evolves throughout the life cycle, just like our process release and stability specs and control strategies, which have also evolved. So just like those evolved around the life cycle, these needs, this is a living document and a, a living piece of information which evolves through the life cycle. Right. So that's uh, the basis uh, for getting uh, the CQA list. Now going into process development and characterization. Biologics drug product, as I mentioned, have complex uh, challenges. So why, during the product design stage, you need to keep in mind that um, apart from developing, uh, uh, developing the product, there are different challenges that need to be addressed, right? So control of CQAs is one aspect of it we talked about. That can be effect on in the drug product container, it can form aggregates particles. The product has to be stable through drug substance and drug product process steps. I've just listed an example of an antibody which goes from drug substance thaw through a pooling and formulation, bioburden reduction, filtration, sterile filtration, filling and stoppering and capping. Uh, these are the unit operations uh, that are applicable to most of the biologics, especially the antibodies. Um, and uh, it, uh, so the molecule has to be robust through these process steps. You may have potent molecules, which are, uh, which are actually uh, hyperpotent at low concentration. So we have the whole formulation space to understand. Uh, it can have, uh, when you put the product in uh, delivery devices, can I have high viscosity, which could be an example of a challenge that you have to encounter. And also container device compatibility needs to be taken into account. So these, there are challenges apart from the molecule challenges, apart from the product itself, these process product, and pro there can be other product and process challenges you need to keep in mind while designing, uh, design, uh, while designing the space of uh, how to develop the product and the process. So, and I, so, how, so how do we do that? So once a CQA is defined, the next steps are, you define a process, do a process risk assessment. You, we, we then go through process characterization studies. Um, and I'll give you examples, I'll walk you through these examples. And then you go through a normal, uh, then you define the normal operating range and prove an acceptable range from these characterization studies. 
we then define what are the what are the critical pro, uh, process parameters and the non-critical process parameters based on their effect on the C, of the CQAs. Then you go to manufacturing, and there are risk assessments involved there before you go develop the control strategy. So this is an iterative process, and if the control strategy is not sufficient, you start from step one. So this is an example of development. Um, um, development uh, QBD concepts and manufacturing QBD uh, concepts, which have to be uh, utilized during manufacturing. So I divide that into upper and lower. So let's walk through a, uh, through a quick example. So here is an example of an antibody um, a manufacturing. We know that by platform knowledge uh, and also through literature knowledge, what are the process steps? I walked you from freeze thaw to formulation to filtration. Uh, we know what are the process steps. We know what are the parameters of these process steps that can affect the uh, critical quality attributes. And you develop a map of, okay, what, what for this particular IgG class or antibody class of molecules, what can be the effect? So I, for example, Filling and uh, mixing can have an impact on aggregation and particles. Transport and uh, cumulative uh, temperature exposure can also have an impact on particles, fragments, and uh, oxidation. So you develop this knowledge through platform, uh, platform aspects, and then you refine it for your own product as, as, uh, as you go through the development cycle, life cycle. So once this is very important to ha uh, have a high level risk assessment, of, hey, what are the areas we want to look at? Uh, what, are the, what do we know already of uh, what process steps can affect the critical quality attributes? And then have, a, have this roadmap established before you do a process risk assessment. So as I mentioned, uh, while talking about the CQA, once your CQA is, is defined and you know the process parameters to evaluate, then you go through a process risk assessment. Um, so here's an example of, the process parameters um, affecting uh, the, the CQAs uh, that, can it, that can be impacted. What is the probability of occurrence? Uh, this is using an FMEA based uh, failure mode and effects analysis. You can also use, if you do not have enough knowledge, you can also use a simple hazards analysis, which is just understanding the impact and occurrence, uh, for example. You don't need a complex uh, uh, FMEA based approach. You can have a simple hazards uh, based approach. But primarily what we want to look at is what are the process parameters? What are the CQAs affected by the process parameters? And whether you have an occurrence or probability of occurrence of that process parameter affecting your CQAs. So here's an example of how um, freeze thaw, a DOE, uh, uh, the formulation and, um, uh, and full process affecting CQAs. And these are marked as high risk and then you go ahead and uh, do a, a process characterization based on, uh, based on this high risk. For ones where we already have platform knowledge and internal knowledge, where it, uh, you already have knowledge that it doesn't affect, those are scored low and uh, there is no, uh, there's not an extensive reason to go and uh, evaluate this through the process characterization studies. So sure, giving this example, the next step is you, go ahead and execute your process characterization studies, right? So uh, as I showed in the previous, uh, previous slide, you have freeze thaw, formulation, and uh, filling, which can be, and, uh, and also the headspace in the vials, which can affect the oxidation of the protein um, uh, to be used. You come up with these uh, DOE-based approaches um, uh, to evaluate the high-risk parameters. So for example, one carefully executed study right, um, where you can combine effect of freeze thaw, formulation space, the head space in the vials, which can, uh, which can affect the oxidation, going through the transport and putting it on stability. You can have one study, carefully designed study, um, to address all the high risk through the process characterization. The way you do that is you have proper controls, pre and post uh, 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 process uh, step controls to ensure, uh, to understand what that process step, how does this uh, process step have an effect on your CQA? So for example, freeze thaw, having multiple freeze thaws, having an effect on CQA. 
you have uh, you study it before and after it has gone through the multiple freestyle and before it goes through we uh, study the formulation space so that process can be repeated across every unit operation so as, as i show you here is an example of in the end you have actually when you uh, uh, by having the right controls pre and post stress you can understand how that uh, for example transport stress uh, uh, subjecting a molecule uh, product through the transport stress, how does the product quality looks like before the stress and after the stress? Gives you a view of uh, the CQAs affected, but you can also put these on long-term stability and see whether any of these stresses causes long-term effect on the product quality. So you can have this combined DOE study, and in some cases, you can have univariate studies. Um, for example, if you are using an isolator, the peroxide in your isolator can impact the product quality. So you may have want to do a, a univariate uh, study where you spike in different peroxide levels and see what happens. Um, so both the combination of DOE and uh, univariate studies will help us develop this knowledge of what is a proven and acceptable range. So the range of process parameters where uh, the product quality attributes do not uh, change meaningfully. And the final step before we go into the control strategy is you use this multivariate analysis. This is an example of a formulation variable where you have um, a product quality changing uh, based on your formulation. Um, here in this example, the pH and concentration seems to be having a significant effect on your aggregate formation, especially on long-term stability. Other, other formulation parameters do not. But Having a statistically significant interaction parameter doesn't mean that's the end. We do need to understand how does it, whether it has a meaningful effect on your CQA. So the way you do it is you actually look at your historic knowledge. Um, what is your uh, product quality attributes? How, the ha how has it changed over time? And based on the tolerance uh, interval or other statistical tools, you, ex, uh, you establish a boundary. And then from your DOE studies, you see over the, uh, over the par uh, parameter ranges that you're evaluating, how much of a change has occurred. And this change uh, is called the impact. Um, and you can compare the impact from the process characterization with your overall goalpost, which is established through your process knowledge. So the impact ratio is calculated as 100 into one by T, and you may have a threshold. Hey, if the product doesn't change uh, more than 20, 40% compared to my goalpost, which is developed by through historic knowledge, then it is not meaningful, then it's not critical. But if it affects more than 20 to 40% compared to the overall range, then it can be classified as a critical process parameter. So many people actually just take the statistically significant pro process and call it as CPPs, but that we, uh, but we do need to apply this filter in order to determine whether a product uh, parameter is a CPP or not. So you go through these exercises and develop the CPP and the non-CPP knowledge. And then finally, control strategy. So once we know what are the critical process parameters um, and uh, um, then we can actually, before we go into process validation or PPQ, we, have we can establish different control strategies. So there is not one control strategy. It, it, just because you are defining CPPs or a critical process parameter list, it doesn't mean that everything has to be, uh, uh, all the CQAs need to go on the control, uh, on, onto the, for release or uh, stability monitoring. There are different tools which could be used. For example, um, uh, if it is a critical formulation parameter, you can control it through raw material controls of excipients coming in. Some other CQAs can be controlled through routine testing. The, the process parameters can be controlled through process controls or process monitoring. Sometimes what you can do is you can go through a process parameter qualification, PPQ, and validate out uh, a, a, a particular process parameter to reduce the risk. Um, you can do characterization testing and compatibility testing. So these are, there are different tool sets. And if uh, I've shared some of these guidance documents in the slide deck, so 
uh, it does not, uh, the, the control strategy that needs to be developed is not one box, it's multiple boxes and you have to bring it all together to ensure a comprehensive control of what you call as critical formulation parameters and critical process parameters to control your CQAs. Okay. So to, in the end, I mean, I think before I go into the con uh, primary container, the overall strategy for development and manufacturing is, as I, as I mentioned, everyone goes through this cycle. You start with the product and process development, process categorization. You, having QBD tools like risk assessment and risk assessments and control strategy defined helps us to streamline and make, it, make the development process more systematic. If, you, if through the risk assessments, you identify that your process is high risk, then for manufacturing, you may have to do pilot scale runs, buffer or placebo runs, engineering runs before you get to the CGMP batches. But if you are finding that, hey, your product is uh, relatively low risk based on platform knowledge already known about the product, and it doesn't show a whole lot of effect on critical quality attributes, and you already have the appropriate control strategy, then you can go, it's a low risk process. So you can go directly from process characterization through CGMP batches. We can avoid all this uh, intermediate steps if the risk is, uh, uh, is, uh, uh, is low. So if the risk is high, you go in a stepwise fashion uh, in making sure if this is successful, then go into the uh, next uh, stage. But if the risk is uh, low, you can directly go from process categorization directly into CGMP batches and going into uh, uh, process uh, parameter, uh, process qualification. So this QBD tools, using the QBD tools at the appropriate stage can help simplify the whole development and manufacturing strategy uh, for uh, if employed, if utilized properly. All right, so the last uh, two minutes or a few minutes, I'm going to talk about um, you have a product and process and understanding. And then in for biologics, um, some of the biologics go into vial presentations, but some of the biologics, we need a pre-filled syringe or on-body injectors, which need to be included. So these come with their own complexities. Um, developing a pre-filled syringe presentation or an on-body um, injector presentation is complex compared to a vial presentation. Um, example is, I mean, for a pre-filled syringe container, that is silicon oil in the pre-filled syringes to lubricate the plunger. So what is the effect of silicon oil on the product? There are tungsten pins which are used to insert the, uh, the needles. Uh, what is the effect of tungsten residues on the product? So each of this parameter needs to be further considered, but how do we do it? The same concepts, risk-based uh, approach. Um, do we know whether this, uh, these uh, factors what do we know from literature, making sure that you read your journal articles, making sure that we have enough platform knowledge will, will simplify the list to a short list of what are the high risk factors that you need to evaluate for your product. So you, just like the product and process, you develop that list for the primary container and you evaluate those through the product characterization studies. So um, as I mentioned, I mean, you have a device and then the drug, you have to think about the drug device, um, a biologic uh, combination, use your product and process knowledge and then bring it all together. Um, same concepts, um, risk assessment and, uh, and uh, control strategy, and then merge it together. Um, there's a whole uh, uh, different guidance document on how to develop uh, uh, combination products and you, uh, for, from the FDA, it's a 21 CFR 820. Each of the countries already have their drug regulations. But what I want to emphasize is primarily that is a drug product profile. We walk through an examples of how to do a stepwise QBD based development for drug product. The same concept applies for combination products that are, as we go from defining the user needs to design input, to design process and verification and validation that are individual risk assessments which are involved there. And primarily what we want to do is, is to allow for both of, the, both of those to happen simultaneously 
drug product and process uh, risk assessments and control strategy development and combination product uh, development and strategy. And then you merge it together in your regulatory filing. So even though the complexity is more, using the same QBD concepts can simplify your development and uh, uh, the, uh, the manufacturing strategy. So I want to end and uh, probably take on questions, but before I end a summary is biologics drug product can be diverse and complex. Uh, what, do you, what do we need to, uh, it can be simplified based because of the extensive amount of knowledge that we have, uh, have for, these, uh, for these biologics um, uh, products. We, it can be simplified of what really matters for your development and manufacturing by using the key QBD, QBD concepts. You will, uh, will have, and these and these QBD concepts need to be uh, used at the right stage. Early stage, you do a high level risk assessments. As we go to late stage, you develop more detailed risk assessments, the and the product knowledge. So in the end, I think having uh, leveraging the risk based and platform approaches of QBD gathered during the development of specific class of molecules helps uh, develop the right approach, appropriate strategy for development and manufacturing. And for high risk, you need to have an extensive development and, and the manufacturing strategy. But for low risk products, it streamlines, it helps you. The QBD, applying QBD helps you because you're already building in the right uh, quality into the system right from the start. In which case you can channel the available resources for low risk product to, uh, to more complex development needs and uh, innovation. So QBD essentially is just not, uh, it's, it's, it's not, oh, we need to do a whole lot on QBD. I think a lot of uh, people in the industry have that mentality. But QBD is more of a grassroots way of streamlining and, and building in process and product knowledge to help you develop the product more effectively. Um, so with that, I want to end my talk and uh, um, I can uh, take questions now, but I'm also available through email um, and I'm, I'll, I'll, uh, that'll be shared with all the audience, okay? Um, so I'll stop and take questions. Thank you very much for the nice presentation. We have several questions that have come in. So I'm just gonna jumping directly. The first one is, um, if I have to compromise between quality or quantity, how useful would QBD be? Or if I have two quality attributes, which can't be compromised, um, how will QBD help? Right. I mean, so as I said, I mean, I think it is, it is actually um, the QBD, uh, applying QBD was going to help because it gives you a relative risk ranking and uh, uh, and helps you. So if you have a fast moving, uh, uh, you need a product to get out there, commercialized within a year, for example, it helps you to risk rank what are the quality attributes and the control strategy you want to develop right now during the development stage, or you monitor once once uh, you have an agreement with, uh, you define this uh, these quality attributes and the control strategies, you work with the regulatory agencies and tell, hey, we are keeping an eye on that. We are keeping an eye on these different quality attributes through continuous process verification. And uh, we will, uh, uh, and it helps you to define um, in a more risk-based approach um, uh, when and how you're going to manage those uh, quality attributes and uh, process parameters. So it, it actually helps you uh, risk rank uh, and, uh, and uh, given 10 different priorities, it helps you prioritize, right? So that's, the, uh, that's where QBD comes in. Thank you very much. Um, the second one is how are critical quality attributes defined in a preclinical product? So before any clinical knowledge is available. Yeah. And as I, as I mentioned, many of it is due based on platform knowledge. So for some, some examples like mRNA products, there may not be enough uh, platform knowledge yet because currently gene therapy, there are 10, uh, uh, a dozen uh, gene, th uh, gene therapy uh, clinical trials ongoing. Uh, uh, mRNA uh, products are uh, pretty recent. Some of these are relatively new. You may not have enough of a platform knowledge, but for antibodies, for example, you have 30, 40 years of um, experience um, 
and publish through several uh, journal articles and resources out there of what may be affected. So it is based on what molecule you're working on. So that is used for defining the platform CQAs. Um, and uh, in some cases, we may not have that knowledge which has to be developed through the development cycle, so. Yeah, I completely agree, thank you. Um, is validation required for the characterization methods? I guess this goes to the, the big slide where you showed us about ELISA and... Yeah, so whether a method lands on a release, if a method lands on a release and a stability uh, monitoring, it's expected it needs to be validated. But if it is a characterization methods, uh, and that's why I emphasize some of the CQAs can be monitored through characterization methods. And the general expectation is characterization methods may be fit for purpose or even need to be qualified, but doesn't need to be validated and doesn't need to be used for continuous monitoring. It could be periodic monitoring of, uh, of some other CQAs. For example, your higher order structure is an example where it's not expected that you have a uh, you have a, a method on the release panel, but you periodically monitor through comparability studies and uh, 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 as an example. So yeah, I mean, you do not need to validate those characterization methods. That's not the expectation. Okay, thank you. Uh, a lot, a lot of questions coming in. I'm, I'm not sure if we will be able to, to do all of these, but thank you everyone. Um, so can you comment on definition of critical versus key parameters and how these link to change control? Yeah. So when it comes to change control, I, I think um, that's, a, uh, that's an aspect where if you're, mon mo uh, if you're modifying any process, if you're modifying the batch records or the process uh, going from for GMP manufacturing, you, we, we do need to actually have a, a, a system in place, a change control so that there's a, a written documentation, a systematic written documentation. Hey, what are you changing? What are the what is the relative risk and uh, moving forward? Now, where does uh, in, the, in the context of CPPs and KPPs, critical process parameters are ones which actually have a, a, a have a, a, a process parameters which have meaningful impact on critical quality attributes. Your key process parameters are your performance parameters like yield. Uh, how many, how much product I get. Um, it's not necessarily the quality attributes. It's more of whether, whether your process is performing well. Um, the, it's, a, it's a metric for that. Now, mm -hmm. you, typically what I've seen is in change control, you pretty much monitor all the parameters. Um, you need to actually document if you're changing any parameter, um, uh, it is important to document all the, uh, all the parameters um, and um, how, using the uh, and uh, the classification of CPPs and KPPs does help uh, when you have a deviation uh, and to understand what is the potential effect on the quality attribute. But from a change control perspective, you have to monitor all the changes, uh, whether it, uh, it actually relates to a, a critical process parameter or a KPP. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, um, uh, this is Matthew. Um, we have uh, several more questions. We'll take a couple more. And then as Krishnan said, he is open uh, to emailing him questions and he will try to answer. Um, I am going to read out another question. Is QBD approach for continuous bioprocessing or manufacturing is the same as batch method or do you have any document or thought in this regard? So Matthew, I don't, I don't know whether I fully understand the question, but I think um, that is actually, I mean, in, in terms of from a quality by design uh, approach, you define the, dis, uh, uh, the, the design space, right? And you monitor the process parameters. I'll try to see whether this addresses the, the question. You, you monitor this process parameters, even after the PPQ through continuous process verification. So there's a CPV where you actually uh, continue to monitor uh, these, uh, these changes. Um, so the, that is a general expectation for, uh, for, uh, by the regulatory agencies. And where the QBD uh, comes in is if you have a design space already well characterized, and if you're making any changes um, in the uh, post-commercial launch, 
they will allow you be, uh, to use that product knowledge or the design space to make those changes uh, if it, that design space is already filed with the regulatory agencies. That's where the QBD comes in. Um, otherwise, if you do not have that, you have to actually show that, that any kind of change um, uh, is captured through change controls and also you have done extensive product assessment that, that is uh, these do, uh, uh, whether they have an impact on critical quality attribute or not. Hopefully that answers the question. Um, uh, so. Okay, thanks. Just one more question. And that is, can we combine process parameters and material attributes in one single design of experiments to assess and optimize the product? Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so when you look through some of these case studies, you will see that the, you, that, that's why, I mean, it, uh, uh, implementing QBD is not that complex, uh, where you have identified the top risk, whether it's materials, process, product, you have the option of combining these into well-designed multivariate, uh, multi, uh, into, a, into DOE kind of approaches and evaluating all at the same time to see whether there is an interaction between these uh, materials and process and product, but also address the high risk uh, items all at the same time. So yes, I mean, absolutely. I think uh, uh, some of the DOE tools have uh, given us the, uh, uh, the possibility of exploring these different factors all at the same time. Great, thank you very much, Christian. This has been a very, very interesting presentation as you could see. Uh, there's a lot of interest, more questions to answer. So um, those questions would likely be emailed to you. And if you can help answer, that would be great. Uh, I want to express our thanks from uh, FIP for you taking the time to make such a fine presentation. Thanks everyone for attending. Thank you. Thank you organizers and thank you everyone. Thanks Maria and Matthew. Thank you very much. All right, take care.